Welcome to today's webinar, AHA! The Eureka Moment and Creative Problem Solving in the Brain. I'm Roberta Diaz-Brinton, the Director of the Center for Innovation in Brain Science at the University of Arizona Health Sciences. I'll be moderating the webinar today. During this presentation, you'll learn about creative problem solving and the cognition that is related to the AHA! or Eureka Moment. We'll address questions that the audience submits at the end of the presentation. Now let's get started. Today I'm going to give you a brief tour of some of the amazing resources BrainFacts.org has available for you. You can see on the home page that BrainFacts has five broad topic areas along the top with a multitude of articles in each category. The thinking, sensing, and behaving section is filled with a large range of topics, including brain development across the lifespan, stress and anxiety, and the five main senses. Under diseases and disorders, you can find information about mental health, Alzheimer's, and epilepsy, amongst others. Take a look under brain anatomy and function to learn more about evolution, cells, and circuits, and body systems. Neuroscience in Society has content related to technology and arts effects on the brain, as well as special materials for educators. And finally, you can, meet, you can find our Meet the Researcher section, as well as information on the newest neurotechnologies under the In the Lab section. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker today. Dr. Mark Beeman is professor and recent chair of psychology at Northwestern University, studying the brain basis of creative problem solving, how mood affects attention and cognition, and how solving can benefit from incubation periods, including even sleep. His research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and other federal and private agencies. Now, let's hear from Mark. Hello, and thank you all for listening today. Um, there are many different aspects of creativity and creative cognition, and I'm going to focus on just one, uh, which is how we come up with new ideas, and in particular, new ideas in the context of solving problems. Often, uh, new and creative ideas arise as people are trying to solve problems, in particular, problems that have previously resisted their solving efforts. Now, I don't want to dismiss the analytic method of solving problems, taking a very methodical and incremental approach is very important and many problems are solved that way, uh, which is why we often talk about standing on the shoulders of giants and even uh, sudden leaps still uh, come off of the shoulders of giants. Uh, but the other way besides more basic analytic solving that people sometimes solve problems is with a sudden insight, a somewhat revolutionary breakthrough where they see the problem in a new light, which has been described as an aha or famously a eureka moment, such as Archimedes supposedly had uh, when figuring out how to prove to the king whether his crown was made of pure gold uh, when he had his Eureka moment in a bath and supposedly ran naked through the streets of Syracuse shouting, Eureka, I have found it. Now, of course, some people argue that that story is apocryphal and we don't really know it's true, but in any case, I'm not quite old enough to have interviewed Archimedes and find out what was really going on in his head. But another more modern Eureka moment happened when Jerry Swartz uh, invented the first handheld price scanner. Uh, Jerry had been a, a physicist looking at uh, optics and light and had had a number of other inventions. And like many other people, um, uh, at the time, uh, countertop price scanners were already in practice, but uh, they were these very large, heavy devices and uh, in included multiple moving laser beams uh, within the countertop and nobody could think about how to shrink the lasers and incorporate them into a handheld device. Uh, so the field and Jerry were at a dead end at trying to solve this problem, but everybody knew it'd be very useful to have a handheld price scanner. If you've ever tried to lift a 50 pound bag of dog food across the grocery counter, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so one day uh, Jerry was home playing with his kids uh, and he had a, a primitive laser pointer. And he was showing the kids how you could create this little dot of red light across the wall, across his apartment, and, um, and even out the window on the cars parked on the road. 
and uh, he'd move it up and down and around, and they were really enjoying themselves. And as a car drove by and he moved the laser pointer up and down, and the car moved in the uh, perpendicular direction, he created a pattern on the side of the car, like a sine wave. And I should mention he was careful to avoid the driver's eyes, but on the side of the car itself, he saw that there was a pattern created and he instantly knew how he could use a pattern like that to create a handheld price scanner. Now, it's important to know that uh, he said that at the time he, this happened, he was not even thinking about the problem. He was just trying to enjoy his time at home with his kids. Um, and he was in a very positive, relaxed mood, which may turn out to be important. But as soon as he saw that pattern of light on the car, he had an, a eureka moment. I knew I had it, he said. I knew I could develop this price scanner. Um, and this exemplifies a eureka moment in a number of ways because he had been stuck and he found a new way of uh, structuring the problem where he could have one laser with mirrors moving in simple patterns to create the complex pattern that he needed to get reflectance from the price code so that the computer could read it. Uh, and that night he sketched out a few prototypes and the next day went into the lab and started building it. And his company, Symbol Technologies, came out with the first handheld price scanner and he got relatively rich on that. Um, and he was sure that many of his uh, inventions had come through these Eureka moments. And in fact, he then sponsored a um, brain seminar on, or brain little conference on um, the brain basis of sudden insight uh, to which I was invited and where I got to talk with and interview Jerry about his invention and experience. So insight, um, although it only happens on rare occasions, it has, a, um, it's important for a number of reasons. One is, it is often uh, responsible for creating uh, very creative solutions to problems where people are able to overcome past barriers. Um, in our lab, at least, when we have people solve a variety of puzzles, uh, they're more likely to be correct if they report that they have solved the problem with insight rather than um, having solved it analytically. Furthermore, people who have insight say that the insight sticks with them, that they have better, more integrated memory about that insight moment. Um, and the experience itself is rewarding and therefore self-reinforcing if it creates a positive mood. But this combination of all these things leads to a great deal of confidence and then therefore persistence in pursuing their theories or ideas or inventions. Um, and sometimes that's important because as Mark Twain once said, a person with a new idea is a crank until the idea succeeds. So when the rest of the world is calling you a crank, you better have some confidence to persist in your ideas. But like many forms of creativity, how can we actually study it? Even if we knew who the next Marie Curie was, we couldn't just stick her in a brain scanner and wait for her to have her aha moment. And even if we could do that, we, one moment wouldn't be enough. We usually need many different moments. We need to have them to be repeatable, and we need to see them across many people to really understand how the brain helps support these moments. So in the lab, we use puzzles. Puzzles that, generally speaking, we think people have enough information to solve, so they don't need to learn some whole new field, but that they have to think about the puzzle in a unique way in order to actually um, come about a solution. So we use some spatial ones like this one, uh, where you are given eight coins in uh, two rows, and you have to imagine moving exactly two coins so that in the new arrangement, each coin touches exactly three others. So uh, that, po that puzzle and others were posted online, and after the talk, um, uh, I'll give the solution to this one and others, and uh, there will also be a file available online for uh, if you want to look up the solutions there. So we had a variety of these spatial puzzles. Uh, there's a wide range of solving time, but usually about a third of people can solve these with anywhere from, within anywhere from one to five minutes. Um, we also have other types of puzzles, like uh, what's called a rebus problem, where you get uh, some collection of letters or words in a box, but they're, they're arranged spatially in some interesting way that's supposed to represent some uh, common phrase, title, or concept uh, that people would be familiar with. Uh, we usually give people anywhere from 30 seconds to two minutes to solve these. Uh, we can sometimes give them more time, but they get a little frustrating if you haven't solved it uh, in, in a short enough time. Again, I can give you the answer to that one later. But one of the most common ones that we've used in my lab uh, is a, a very short verbal problem that can be solved in anywhere from 15 to 30 seconds. That is, if you're going to solve it at all. About half the time these get solved. We wouldn't learn anything if everybody solved all the problems. So we have to know what are the situations that make them easier or harder to solve. Now, uh, there had been an existing test called the Remote Associates Test, affectionately known as the RAT, uh, 
uh, where you got three words like tennis, same, and strike, and you had to come up with a solution word that had something, anything really, in common with each of the three problem words. So in the case of this problem, um, you could say uh, match, because tennis match is a thing, you can strike a match, and same and match are roughly synonymous. But these are very tricky problems because you're not sure how the solution word will be related to the problem word. So we made it a bit simpler and we gave people a direction that each of the three problem words can form a compound word or a familiar two word phrase with the solution word. So it has to be a two word phrase or a common uh, or an actual compound. Um, so these can be solved, as I said, in, in about 15 seconds is the time we usually give them now. But people will solve about a third, although there's a very, very wide range and it varies from problem to problem a lot too. So what's easy for one person might be hard for another. Um, and we've used these um, compound remote associate problems, or CRAs as we call them, to look at a number of different features of processing, including some of those that I talked about before, such as the idea that uh, unconscious processing is involved in trying to solve these. Um, so one way that we have looked at this is to uh, have people uh, do a task where they're primarily trying to solve a problem, like the three words that I just gave you, and they work on that for a while. And at some time limit, if they have not solved it yet, um, a solution word can flash on the screen or a control word will flash on the screen. And their job is to simply read the word or in some experiments to actually recognize whether or not that is the solution. So we might flash up the word brain, which in this case works because you can have a brain child, a brain scan, and there is a, such a thing as a brain drain. And you notice that the word appeared on the right side of the screen, so in this case, if a word appears in the right visual field and you're looking straight ahead, it will get directed initially to the left hemisphere and vice versa. And that allows us to tap into relatively more of right or left hemisphere processing depending on which side of the screen the word appeared on. Now, when we do this, we find several things. We find that people respond very quickly to the solution word when it's paired with its problem as opposed to when it's paired with a different problem. And that shows us that there's unconscious activation of the solution word before people are able to utilize that activation to solve anything. So activation here just means people are thinking about it, and presumably with neurons that are active. And this is especially true if we show the word to the right hemisphere via the left visual field. And in fact, um, if we ask people to judge whether the word is the solution or not, people will recognize the solution faster when it's presented to the right hemisphere via the left visual field than the other way around. And that's really dramatic because um, we always show a right visual field or left hemisphere advantage when responding to words. So the fact that they actually responded faster to the left visual field right hemisphere words is really uh, a remarkable finding in that experiment. Furthermore, we find that both of these effects are even stronger or more, um, uh, more dramatic when uh, people report that they have solved the problem with insight as opposed to resolving it analytically. Particularly true in the right hemisphere. So this suggests that in a way this uh, aha or eureka feeling has a little bit to do with a sort of knew it all along effect. That is to say, oh, I had some unconscious activation of that, but because it was unconscious, I, I couldn't report it yet. But now that I see the answer, it makes perfect sense. And I, I think I actually had that somewhere in my brain, just not available to me. Um, and you know the idea that this happens more strongly in the right hemisphere fits with this idea that uh, what I've suggested is that for semantic processing, the right hemisphere engages in relatively coarse semantic coding. So while the left hemisphere strongly activates information that's closely related to input words, which is really helpful when you're trying to understand quickly what people are saying, the right hemisphere activates a larger semantic field or more information, including things that are distantly related to the word or related to alternative meanings, like the idea that a foot could mean 12 inches rather than the thing that's at the end of your leg. Now, that might be pretty tricky if you're trying to understand what somebody's saying and you can't figure out what they mean by the word foot, but it might allow for these distant semantic relations to overlap when you have multiple words, like in the slide I showed earlier when I presented the problems in the first place. So you can find connections across these larger semantic fields. So all of that was happening when people were failing to solve problems because we need to look at <clears throat> their response to the actual words. But what happens when we're looking, what we really want to know is what happens when people are actually solving the problem. And we'd like to see what's happening in the brain. So we turn to neuroimaging, specifically fMRI, to look at what's happening when people are reporting that they're solving with 
insight? And is it really different from when they actually still solve the problem, but solve it more analytically? And of course, if it is different, how is it different? And that how is a little bit informed by where we see activation in the brain. So we predicted that solving these tricky problems would require a special kind of semantic integration, making new connections across information that's only distantly related or weakly active in response to the problem words themselves. And that this would be activated in a primarily, or one key area would be the right hemisphere anterior temporal lobe, because that had shown up in a few experiments in language comprehension as being important for a similar kind of process. Uh, we also thought that areas of the brain involved in cognitive control and switching attention would be important, and this would include a frontal network, including areas known as the anterior cingulate cortex and lateral prefrontal cortex. So what we did is we gave people these problems, and at the time represented by, uh, uh, by the red arrow, at some random time when the subject solved it, which was completely up to them, um, we would look at neural activity for about two seconds prior to them solving to see what happened just before they solved these problems. So what's happening at the Eureka moment? Uh, and then subjects would report the solution, and then they would report to us whether they had solved it analytically or with insight. And we gave them some training on this, but most people understood that intuitively as having a sort of mini aha moment. So the question is, were different things going on in the brain when people said they solved with insight, or did it just feel different? And what was going on? Um, now notice that um, this is a very, um, so we were doing what's called an event-related neuroimaging design. In fact, we were looking at activity that's locked to the solution of when they came up with the answer. And we were comparing insight solutions versus non-insight or analytic solutions. Um, so this is a very tight comparison. It's not going to reveal every area involved in solving, just the areas that are different for insight compared to solving analytically. And sure enough, we found a variety of differences. This is from uh, our second experiment looking at this, where we were able to test more subjects and with better brain imaging data, but it exactly matched what we found the first time, which was strong activation in the right anterior temporal lobe, which was one of our predicted areas, and that we think is involved in integrating distant semantic relations. Uh, some areas involved in memory and attention, and also uh, the anterior cingulate cortex, which is one of the key areas involved in cognitive control. That's that midline frontal area in the left brain image, and it's circled in blue. Um, interestingly, uh, we wanted to know if, uh, if this was similar across different types of problems. Um, so, so first, I should tell you, uh, we also did this experiment with EEG, and uh, we found a gamma band activity in the same area with um, uh, over the scalp of the right hemisphere uh, at a particular frequency of EEG that suggests that this was the solution essentially emerging into consciousness because gamma band frequencies associated with binding information into a conscious percept. Now, interestingly, we also see, um, uh, we wanted to see if we'd get similar types of brain activity with different types of problems. So we gave people visual images uh, where people could solve an image like this sketchy outline here, try to figure out what it is. And people sometimes have the experience of solving these with insight where they get a gestalt-like effect of the whole image coming to them at once. And other times they might solve it sort of piece by piece by say looking at the top and saying, well, those look like two ears, but what kind of animal stands up like that? And they might figure out eventually that it was actually a kangaroo. All this, like those other problems, you can solve it with a sort of feeling of insight when it comes as a whole, or you can solve it piece by piece more analytically. And when we looked at that, and this was a bit of an underpowered experiment, so the data here are, are actually a little bit weak, but we actually found almost exactly parallel areas to what we found before, um, but sensible in a different way where the, some of the areas involved were more involved in um, object recognition rather than word processing. But we found the same cognitive control and anterior temporal lobe of the right hemisphere involved um, uh, in solving these problems that depended on visual processing as well as the verbal ones. So we can start to answer the question of where do insights come from, and not surprisingly, they come from the brain. Um, but it's not just anywhere in the brain, it's specific areas in the brain, and they indicate that people are involved in integrating distantly related semantic information, in switching their attention from their earlier thoughts about the problem to these newer ones that, rel that relied on this semantic integration, and maybe some special things going on with memory as well. We also see that there are prior processes. So sometimes insights feel like they come from nowhere and they just jump in without you doing any work on them. 
but there's actually stuff going on in your brain in the background, unconsciously beforehand. And we can see a little bit of evidence for this in our experiments. We saw some antecedents, so a little bit before we get that gamma band activity in um, the temporal lobe, we saw some early alpha wave activity um, over the visual lobe, which suggests that people were essentially quieting the visual input to concentrate on an internal idea. Now, you should keep in mind that they actually uh, were looking at a problem presented visually, so it's not clear whether they're specifically blocking out the problem or just sort of looking inside to find, uh, to pay attention to their internal ideas. But we see this uh, increase in alpha only for insight and only uh, about two seconds or one and a half seconds before people solve the problem, exactly coinciding, the end of the alpha wave exactly coincides with the onset of the gamma band uh, increase. So we think these two things are causally related. So we think this is the brain's way of sort of shutting down visual input so you can think of your uh, internal ideas. And it might be like if you were trying to solve a problem or think of something that is a little bit elusive thought, you might look outside the window or look at a blank wall. So you're not getting distracted by the visual input. But in the EEG experiment, we tell people don't move your eyes and don't blink because both of, both of those things create artifacts in the EEG and we have to toss those trials. But we wanted to test this more directly and sort of more naturally by following people's eyes as they were trying to solve these problems. So in an eye tracking experiment, um, we looked at, for instance, how often people blink. And we found that in that same solution period, about two seconds before people solve a problem, people actually blink more and longer prior to insight. So here they're literally shutting out the outside world, only briefly, but uh, for longer durations prior to solving problems by insight than prior to solving them non with non-insight or analytically. So this suggests that they're actually, again, doing something different with their attention when they're solving with insight. Um, we can also see it in the number of uh, times that they move their eyes. So if you're actively engaged in looking at the environment, you're going to move your eyes to the problem words. And when they're moving their eyes a lot, um, that's what you see prior to people solving problems without insight or analytically. And when they're solving with insight, they're not really moving their eyes a lot. It's as if they're not engaged in the problem visually. The eyes kind of just drift out there. And in fact, if we look specifically at where they're looking, um, where that is where they're fixating their eyes just prior to solution, usually people are looking at the problem, but this is especially true prior to solving a problem analytically. So there were more fixations on the problem or inside the problem box prior to analytic solutions and prior to insight ones. But they looked away from the problem or outside the problem box prior to solving by insight more often than prior to solving analytically. So uh, I guess it might be true that actually to solve problems uh, creatively, um, you want to look outside the box. So we can conclude from the solving period that uh, insight is indeed supported by distinct cognitive and neural components, including areas of the right temporal lobe to involve, to integrate distant semantic elements, the anterior cingulate cortex to indicate readiness to detect and switch to competing candidates. Um, people blink more and fixate less on the problem when they're solving with insight, and they look outside the box prior to solving by insight. All of this suggests that people have to be flexible in their attention, ready to switch, ready to disengage from input, and ready to connect things that are only distantly related. Whereas when they solve analytically, they have a more bottom-up approach, approach where they're engaged on the input. They keep looking at the problem, that is, they're looking inside the box. So they're staying engaged on the input and using focused semantic activation. So uh, another question that people have is, you know, when you think about where ideas come from is, uh, how can you prepare your mind to solve more, uh, to, more creatively? Uh, there's a famous quote from Pasteur saying that in the fields of observation, chance favors only the prepared mind. Now, he may have meant education or hard work by that, but it also might be that you have a, a mind that can be prepared to think creatively by being in a particular attentive state. So we looked at this, again, with multiple different uh, methodologies. We use the same kind of paradigm. So prior to solving a problem like tooth, heart, potato, where there's a compound solution or a word that can form a compound with each of those three problem words, and you'll have to figure that one out yourself. Um, but prior to that, people were just staring at a blank screen for this uh, preparation period, which was also an important component of the um, fMRI methodology. 
Uh, and we look to see, is there anything different going on in this preparation period before problems that people were able to solve analytically compared to before problems that they were able to solve by insight? So in both these cases, they went on to solve problems. It's not like they were just sleeping sometime, but uh, they were sort of, the brain was more conducive in a state that was more conducive to solving one way or the other, at least in theory. So we wanted to know, is there difference, are there differences in brain activity in this period when there's really nothing going on? So that would just reflect that your brain is in a different attention state. You're ready for things differently, but you're not actually processing information at this point. Sure enough, we found differences in fMRI, which I won't tell you about, but they match very well onto the processes that were proposed to be involved in solving my insight, and in EEG in a parallel experiment. Uh, and again, with EEG, we saw that blue over the back of the brain represents that you were actually sort of ready to shut out input from, uh, from the visual screen, or you're more focused internally, less focused externally in that neutral period before you get a problem if you go on to solve it by insight. So naturally, we also went to look at that with eye tracking and blinks. And we found that people, again, with nothing on the screen, people blink more and longer when they're in a state of mind that was conducive to solving the problem with insight before the problem even appears. So this is just their attention state and how it's influencing how they go on to solve the problem. And likewise, um, people made more fixations. Their eyes were more engaged and more ready to process visual information prior to problems that they went on to solve analytically or without insight compared to solving problems with insight. So from all this, um, we can see that um, specific areas of the brain are involved, that there are antecedents within the problem and antecedents even before a, pro uh, a problem is given to a subject uh, that tell you whether the brain is ready to solve by insight. Well, given that's true, uh, we might wonder if there are ways to actually facilitate insight. And the first question I have to ask whenever anybody asks me, how can we have more insights is, do you really want to? Um, after all, we have quotes from people like Thomas Edison who said, genius is just 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So don't be ready for insight, just keep working on problems hard. Um, but strangely, even though Edison said that, there are some interesting stories about he actually prepared himself to be in the proper state to have these sudden insights and creative ideas. So one of the ways that this might, um, the insight might be facilitated is being in a positive mood. So I mentioned earlier that Jerry Swartz was in a positive mood playing with his kids prior to his Eureka moment. And so we looked at that in the lab as well. And we could look at it a couple of ways. One is just measure people's mood when they come into the lab before they even know what kind of experiment they're in. And what we found is that people who came into the lab in a positive mood solved more problems and in particular more problems with insight. So from left to right, we go from lower positive affect to higher positive affect. And people solve more and more problems by insight when they're in a higher positive mood. That's a little bit the flip side of anxiety. When they're in an anxious mood, they actually solve fewer problems by insight and perhaps more problems analytically. Um, we also tested this by taking subjects and putting them into a positive mood or an anxious mood. And we did this by showing them different film types and watching how solving changed. So we had people watch comedies, which put them into a positive mood. And when we did so, that created more insight. They had more problems solved by insight in that case. That's represented in the left pair of bars. Uh, but when they watched scary movies, such as in the right pair of bars, that decreased the number of insight solutions that they came up with. Uh, furthermore, when we look at brain activity, we see that when people are in a positive mood, we get brain activity in the anterior cingulate cortex in particular, that actually looks quite similar to the activity that's shows up from trial to trial when people are um, uh, in the preparation period before people go on to solve problems by insight compared to when they solve analytically. So it's as if people in a positive mood are just overall more prepared to be in an intention state that will help them solve problems with sudden insight. So um, positive mood um, puts you in a state uh, can modulate activity in cognitive control and attention regions that help you solve problems with insight. It doesn't turn on the right hemisphere or the right anterior temporal lobe. It just makes your attention more sensitive to ideas that might be coming up in those areas. So you can normally think about typical attention. We enhance our processing of a target and we inhibit distracting information. When people are anxious, they tend to have an exaggerated focus and get tunneled 
tunnel vision, such as what's been termed weapon focus. So you zero in on one thing and you kind of ignore everything else. But a positive mood seems to induce an attention that has more distributed and less selective attention. So instead of squashing these weak ideas, you allow them to percolate until they can make the connections that help illuminate the solution. So if you want to facilitate insight, obviously you have to pay attention to the problem. Um, but how? Well, when you initially start processing a problem, you probably want to focus your attention and analyze, gather information, uh, and think about it as much as you can. Even people who describe their uh, sudden insights often say that they had a long period of, of thorough analytic attention to a problem before they were ready to have the insight. But when you are ready, that's when you want to find a way to distribute your attention and be less selective so that you're ready for insight. You also might want to look away from the problem, to look outside the box and not keep focusing on it. So sometimes you need to step away from a problem and allow it to incubate. And in fact, the, uh, the old adage of sleeping on it might also be useful because the processes of memory consolidation and reorganization might be particularly fruitful for solving with insight. And we've been finding some really interesting things with that in my lab recently, uh, but nothing I can tell you about today. Um, so in conclusion, we find that insight does indeed uh, occur with distinct cognitive and neural components. That is, different processes lead to insight versus analytic solutions. Furthermore, different attention states are conducive to insight versus analytic solutions. And this occurs both in short and long time ranges within a problem and within and across people. So different individuals might be more or less prone to insight, even though this ability might be shifted by mood and attention. And this, all of this work can serve as a model for interaction between mood, attention, and cognition. So um, we posted some puzzles online beforehand, and I gave you a couple of examples before. Uh, the puzzles and answers are available online now, but I can tell you about the two that we uh, presented in this talk. So um, we talked about having eight coins in two rows and you have to move exactly two. Um, the answer is if they're actual coins, you can take the two middle ones and lift them off and pile them on top of the other three. So instead of thinking outside the box, you're thinking outside of two dimensions. So you actually have to physically move the pennies on, on top of each other. Um, and for this rebus problem, what familiar phrase is represented in the box? This is probably my favorite rebus problem. I'm not sure why, but the answer to this one is three blind mice uh, because they have no eyes. Um, so those are the answers to those problems. And there's uh, one more here you could probably figure out. Um, and it is the last but not least slide that I have. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And um, I hope that you'll stick around for questions. Thanks, Mark, for a fascinating uh, talk on creativity and aha moments. We'll start answering questions now. And the first of those is, does the aha effect involve specific neurotransmitters? For example, acetylcholine and dopamine. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for the question. Thanks all for listening. Um, that's a really interesting question, and uh, I'm afraid I can only provide a pretty speculative answer, but it's interesting in two ways. One is, um, are there specific neurotransmitters that are conducive, or that you know, higher rates of activity in those transmitter systems are conducive to responding with insight or to be, being able to solve a problem with insight? Then also, what effect does solving with insight have on neurotransmitter systems? Um, so I'd say, there's very little direct evidence on it where we actually are measuring uh, neurotransmitters. Um, the, the effects from solving with insight are, are at least initially pretty transient, so I don't know what we could do to find really good markers of those immediately. Um, but there is at least some um, sort of uh, circumstantial evidence for a couple of different transmitter systems being involved. And one is dopamine, uh, which was uh, mentioned by the questioner. Um, and uh, it's a complicated story because there are several uh, dopamine systems, and uh, it seems as if turning some of them on without turning the others is uh, very useful. So, for instance, um, one thing that people try to do sometimes to enhance creativity, that is when organizations or um, uh, policymakers, is to provide an award, a reward for coming up with creative answers. But that there's some research suggesting that actually has negative consequences on coming up with insight when people. Um, are working for a reward. They work with systems that are 
end up being very, very focused, and um, and that high degree of focus is good for a lot of processing, but it might prevent you from seeing the sort of weaker yet more creative ideas that, that you need to focus on. Um, and dopamine system is part of the reward network. But we found that if we actually stimulate the dopamine system another way, sort of subliminally by presenting uh, subliminal cues so people can't see um, outright, but they are at least getting a hint that an upcoming trial will be more rewarded, that that seems to enhance uh, responding with insight. Uh, and also, uh, that in turn, responding with insight uh, increases people's willingness to sort of bet on the next problem so that, uh, again, is they're more confident and their dopamine reward system is encouraging them to respond with insight, and they seem to be a little more successful in doing that. Uh, in, in general, there's some other evidence suggesting that perhaps neuroepinephrine systems are, uh, are somewhat consistent with at least some of the stages of um, or processes that are involved in solving with insight. But again, the, the evidence is pretty uh, peripheral on that. Uh, the other component was that I talked about um, blinking rates when people are doing nothing but staring on the, at the screen. And we interpreted that as sort of being internally focused. But it's also true that spontaneous blink, blink rates are associated with uh, dopamine function uh, of a particular component of the dopamine system. So there might be some really interesting uh, things to look at there, but uh, I haven't been able to investigate that myself. Hmm. So another question, why do you ask people to give rating of insight or analytic? How does that affect the results? Um, so yeah, people notice that as we um, are presenting puzzles, we often give people puzzles. And we, uh, in many of our studies, not all of them, but many of them, we actually ask people to report to us how they solve the problem. Uh, and that comes up for a number of reasons. One is that um, a lot of the old work with insight was um, really um, trapped by finding that there were a certain small set of problems that had been identified as quote unquote insight problems, these sort of classic insight puzzles. The problem is when you give those to any group of people, somebody's going to solve it with purely analytic processing. And on the other hand, you know, what might be an analytic process for you, um, you know, I, I might not have the tools yet to, to solve it analytically. I might need to have a, a sudden insight to even get there to start solving it. Um, so just labeling a problem as being an insight or analytic problem is not usually enough. Um, so we give people the chance to tell us themselves, and we train them a bit on how you know, to recognize um, whether something happened with insight, like if they had a sudden change in processing, the, the solution occurred to them as sort of surprising and sudden and yet confident, um, where the whole solution came in all at once. Those are all signs that uh, you've solved it with insight. And we've, But because we are now able to use various um, brain and physiological measures like EEG, fMRI, and eye tracking, we can see that there are really strong um, objective correlates of that. So even though people are making these subjective ratings, we have very strong evidence that they represent different things that go, went on in their brain, different sets of processes that led to these feelings. Great. So another question, which brain networks and which functional connections are the key players for creativity? Um, so that's, um, you know, creativity broadly speaking, there's just so much going on that it's hard to uh, answer a question about uh, creativity broadly. But it, in terms of just our um, set of problem-solving studies, um, we can see different brain systems involved. Um, I, I think the ones that I mentioned in the talk were, one, you have to be ready to sort of find distant connections or pay attention to ideas that are only weakly active. And you have to be ready to um, you know, actually be able to detect the weak ideas. So usually when we focus on things, we, we focus on one thing and squash all the others. Um, but that might get in the way of actually solving by insight. So um, you want to sort of search your possible solution space with some amount of attention, but don't be too committed to any one idea uh, until um, you can let the ideas sort of percolate and find their own connections and coherence to point you to the right um, set of ideas. So uh, the systems that we see are involved in cognitive control, attention, memory, and again, this sort of particular kind of semantic processing where you're able to find these distant connections. Hmm. So is the Eureka moment associated with the functioning of the limbic system? Um, for that one, so limbic system for people who don't know is usually associated with um, emotion. And um, so I would say on, on the one hand, yes, because um, we have uh, evidence that you know, putting people in a positive mood makes them more apt to solve with insight and putting them in an anxious mood makes them less apt to solve with insight, make, creates this uh, sort of high degree of focus, which is good for a lot of things, but not necessarily for uh, creative problem solving. Um, 
So, uh, so that's part of the answer, but also the areas of the anterior cingulate cortex, that one that we call a cognitive control area, but the particular area that we see is one that sort of links up the limbic system with the cognitive control system. So it seems like it's a really important gateway between these two different systems. And uh, so I, I would answer, yes, it's, uh, the limbic system is involved, um, and it's helping to sort of modulate um, the kinds of thinking that we do, that basically the, the, our state of attention and state of mood uh, affects how we process a lot of information and in ways that can help or hinder insight. Great. So how can we improve our problem-solving skills according to neuroscience? Um, well, um, the, as I said in the talk, you know, one, one uh, answer I always have to that question is um, be careful what you wish for. And sometimes if, we're, if, if these two states of attention that help us solve with insight or analysis are in some ways opposing, you know, very focused attention is good for analytic solving and, and uh, this sort of very less selective, more distributed attention is good for solving with uh, insight or solving more creatively, then um, you want to make sure you're in the right state of mind to do one or the other, right? So um, if you don't yet have all the information, I mentioned that the problems we give people, we assume they already have the background knowledge to solve them. Um, but if you still need to collect more information, you're not ready for an insight, you want to stay in an analytic mindset longer. So I think we really don't have a cookbook a cookbook answer, but the, it's ideal to be aware of the different steps, the processes that are involved in solving generally and, and how you're solving, um, how you've solved before and how you're solving in this particular problem. So if you can try to assess where you are and uh, do you have enough information or, uh, or do you still need to, uh, to analyze more information before you're ready? Are you stuck? Do you, and if you're stuck, are you stuck on a wrong idea? Do you need to sort of step away from the problem and get past that wrong idea? Um, and in particular, if you feel this sort of nagging sensation, like, oh, there's, there's something in there, uh, this sort of intuitive sense that people sometimes get that, they're, that there's something in there, but they don't have access to it, but certainly they'd rec recognize the solution if they saw it, um, that sort of state of intuition might be telling you that now would be a good time to do something like to incubate on the problem, which is to step away from it and let sort of some unconscious processing do its trick, where people have their own routes for doing that. Uh, an architect that I talked to used to have an interesting way, which was to ride the subway, well, the elevated subway around um, Chicago's downtown area. Uh, and it was because it was just distracting enough to prevent him from focusing on the problem um, or, or anything else. And just it allowed his mind to wander until he could come up with some ideas. It wasn't overly distracting. He didn't hear all the other chatter going on. Um, so, you know, but, but someone else might prefer a, a, a quiet uh, walk through the woods or a, a, a sitting along a lake or something like that. Also, mm -hmm. it turns out that sleep can be particularly useful, um, or at least it appears to be, and we have some interesting um, data that will be coming out on that soon, but others have already uh, provided uh, tantalizing evidence for this. So uh, if yeah. you sort of think about a problem before going to sleep, that might be helpful as well. Mm. So to dovetail with that, a very translational question, what type of habits can one develop to induce the brain to be in a state of working on a problem in the background? Uh, um, so working on a problem in the background is kind of hard to do because by, by necessity, you know, it's in the background, so you don't want to be thinking about it. So some of the evidence from psychological studies suggests that uh, sort of like the, the state that I mentioned of riding around on the subway worked for that one person. But you want to, um, when you're incubating, you want to be in a state where you're not so busy on something else that your your brain can't do anything, but um, you also want to be busy enough or distracted enough that you can't focus on the problem. So that's what you want to do when you're ready for the insight. But again, it might kind of depend on uh, where you are in the problem set before you know that you're in the right state. So I think the habits might be to make sure that you have some time um, in your sort of problem solving time where you can be really focused, where you can analyze a problem and really get to understand it uh, from every angle. And then some other time where you're allowing yourself to uh, sort of your mind to wander a bit um, and, and or to work on something else that's not so overwhelmingly um, engaging that you, that you have a little bit of space in the background to do some more processing. So a little bit of variation in your uh, work habits um, uh, where you're still working in both cases but um, with different types of strategies. Hmm. Well, another translational question. Is, is there any studied benefit based on the power of the right temporal lobe to closing the right eye when considering a visual problem or puzzle? Um, so first I would note that um, we don't see 
within each hemisphere from the right eye or left eye, but from the right or left visual hemifield. So closing one eye doesn't help because you still get information to both hemifields. But if you could just view a problem with just the left half of your visual space, if you look straight ahead and the problem is to the left, maybe. But for the most part, when we're getting information, we, we share it across the hemispheres. We have seen differences in sensitivity to information related to solutions. Uh, one of the first studies I presented in a talk was that where we we're looking at something called priming to see how quickly you can recognize a solution and so forth. Um, so there we're tapping into what the right hemisphere is doing. But, but we were making the information about the problem available to both hemispheres at once. So I'm not sure. And, and, and furthermore, um, you know, even for any complicated problem, um, you know, you're going to need to process it with all the information you have. I mean, um, I'm not sure about the uh, questioner, but for me to, to do even a very simple task, I really need all my brain. And I think most of the time we're using all the different processes. And what the right and left hemisphere both do are both contributing to almost any task that we do. So, um, so I'm not sure about that. And then the other um, thing, the, the other methods that we've used to um, enhance problem solving when we see or solving by insight, when we see those changes, they're not turning on the right hemisphere. They're just changing your attention system so that you're now more sensitive to ideas that the right hemisphere might have been useful in helping to uh, develop in the first place. Great. Now we have a very pragmatic question. Um, so there was a per listener who was looking at fluent and creative conditions in his or her EEG data, and they saw in your slides, your study investigated two seconds before the insight time. And they're wondering whether they should go with two seconds. before the time when the participants started giving the response. I'm assuming uh, well, that will mean something to you. <laughs> yeah. So this is someone who wants to do research in it. Um, it's um, or is doing research on it. Um, so we were looking for a, a sudden change to mark the insight moment in here, and and we found that, and and we do see that things are changing right at the last moment. So often when people come up with the insight solutions, again, it's so obvious and intuitive once they come up with the idea that they can respond very quickly and they know that's the solution. So that last two second period, we saw some very interesting neural, and we've seen in other experiments cognitive events or also changes in eye moving, eye movements and blinks and all that. Um, so that's a really useful time to look at. What, what I'd actually say is you want to make sure you break it up and differentiate between these. If you look at the entire solving period, if, you have, if you're engaged in a problem for a minute and then you have a sudden change of idea in the last two seconds, well, if you average over the whole minute, you're going to miss the importance of that last two seconds. So you probably want to see what's going on early and then you want to compare it to what's going on late uh, in each, and then in each case contrasting uh, the creative or insightful ideas versus other kinds of ideas or... Um, that sort of approach. So this will be our last question. If listeners have more questions after the webinar, um, you can submit them below. And that last question is, what tools are used during this type of research? So, um, well, we gave, uh, you know, some examples from some of the types of tools that we use, and, and we've used others. Uh, by tools, I'll take it as a broader uh, definition. We include things like, um, you know, measuring someone's personality, measuring their uh, real-world creative potential or creative achievements. Um, and so there are questionnaires that are, do that. Or you can measure their creativity on one task and then try to manipulate their creativity in another task. Um, um, we also are looking, as I mentioned before, at sleep. And you can try to um, measure sleep. You can try to actually alter some aspects of sleep or the processing that goes on during sleep. And you can try to change it in ways that you think would either favor some Again, during sleep, you're really not solving the problems. Usually, you're doing what we'd call incubation, doing some kind of background work that will help you solve the problem when you when you do approach it again. Um, and, and then besides that, um, you know, someone mentioned the pharmacology. That was the question that we got earlier, the different neurotransmitters. It would be great to look at that. That's sort of outside my, uh, my toolbox. But um, 
the answer almost always in cognitive neuroscience and neuroscience generally is as many tools as you can. Um, we need replication and we need converging evidence. Every tool has its pros and its cons, and we need to, to take advantage of all of them. So in our experiments, you know, when we paired up EEG and fMRI, the EEG gave us very good timing information and the fMRI gave us a very good spatial location. With only one or the other, we really would have doubted the results, but because we got the same result with two different tools, each with a, a different, a complementary set of pros and cons, it was really much more convincing. So multiple tools and, um, and really, ultimately, we want to make sure that we're keeping cognition in the picture. We're really asking, in our case anyway, about how their brain comes up with creative ideas. So we really have to look at uh, the brain and the thinking process and do so in as many ways as we can, and then pair that up with uh, physiological measures whenever possible. Wonderful. Well, Mark, thank you so much. This was very, very uh, enlightening. And thanks to all the listeners for joining us for the AHA Eureka Moment webinar today. After we close, a, you'll see a short survey come up, and we encourage your feedback so we can continue improving uh, brainfacts.org webinars. Thanks again, and we look forward to you being part of our future events.